That's a great idea. I'll be doing it visually on the front as well. So, yes, exactly. Okay, so I'm going to call up any logic here. Um, just we're going in screen that that shows some information on on um, sort of example model that it comes with. Uh, if you see that, um, we'll want to uh, minimize what it looks like, but. Uh, will orient you a little bit to the environment and dive into those those models, okay? Um, AnyLogic is a multi-method modeling platform. It supports three primary types of modeling. Agent-based modeling, the focus of this workshop, discrete event modeling and system dynamics or, or, or ordinary differential equation-based modeling. If any of you see this sort of representation here, you will want to press this button to minimize it. There's some very interesting examples here, including things, say, in cardiovascular disease and, and uh, infectious disease spread, alcohol risks and harm, which you may find interesting. We have contributed a number of those models from my group, which now are now packaged with any logic. But if you minimize that, um, I'd like you to go over and do file, open, and I know many of you have already done this who are here early. Um, in this examples folder that we've provided on the thumb drive, you should find two models. Um, one is directly in that folder, crowding disparities, SIRS, SK, Service Network Bootcamp. TAs, could you make sure, particularly those who are not here up front, um, can easily find these models? Because most of the people have already loaded them. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so this crowding disparities one, and once you open that, you'll be able to open it up here, okay? Op you can open it up and you should see it up here. And the second one um, that you will want to open is, is one that's in a, uh, the folder hybrid modeling, hybrid models. And this one is one called introductory teaching GDM version 4. Okay? Um, so um, that one will come later. Uh, I'll watch it. But the first one is this crowding disparities model. Now, when we open this model up, we will see a buzzing, blooming confusion. We will see a lot going on here. Wow, there's all sorts of things going on. Um, and your screen will probably look something like like this. I'll get these out of the way here. Um, we were using this before the session started. So here um, you will see a depiction of model structure and you'll see that this model actually um, contains a number of pieces and these pieces are broadly of two different sorts. One is information the model needs to, to, uh, to describe its kind of theory of the world. Models like this they characterize a theory of how things might work out there in the world. And they help us understand the implications of that theory for, for understanding patterns that we see in the world, to understand the implications of that, to, to understand, for example, whether that theory is consistent with, as an explanation of certain patterns we see in the world. They can also, a theory of, of the world as captured up here, can also help us evaluate the impact of different interventions. And so, for example, if we go click on person here in this crowding disparities model, we will see a kind of theory of personhood as characterized by this model, okay? Um, and uh, this theory of personhood um, involves some articulated pieces, uh, one of them is a depiction of a natural history of infection um, that is posited for the sake of this model that's posited to obtain for a person. That is, a person starts susceptible um, or infective in a mild state, and they progress subsequently through a series of stages, okay? Um, and uh, you'll notice that there's some waning immunity involved and that they can go back to a susceptible state. Um, there is also a theory, as it were, about care-seeking behavior, um, the degree to which people seek care and how quickly they seek care. Um, a person is associated with some other, other information. For example, in this model, they have an income. So we see this model is depicting 
a certain uh, stylized um, characterization of what it means to be a person uh, with respect to this model. Um, but there's, that's not the only uh, element of the model. We also have a depiction of a clinic. And this clinic has a certain workflow associated with it. So people are taken in for the clinic and some of those individuals wait for care, others balk. Um, and uh, those who wait for care uh, can subsequently undergo uh, treatment and um, they may further undergo counseling, uh, for example, involving risk behaviors, think sexual, uh, sexual high risk individuals. They might undergo some, some counseling to, uh, to, to help advise them on to how to uh, lower their their risk exposures. Um, and following a, uh, an articulated process here, um, they are then, um, uh, they then depart the clinic. Individuals can also balk. That is, they can leave the clinic without being seen, okay? Um, so we have a depiction of a person, a theory of personhood of how a clinic works. And then we're going to have a so-called main class, which is gonna knit these together. It's be, gonna be kind of the environment in which the clinics and the people are placed, in which they interact with each other, um, person, 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 clinic, and uh, in which the uh, transmission of infection will, will play out. So a model like this describes a theory of the world. Why do we turn to a model to describe a theory of the world? Because it helps us think more crisply and precisely about what our theory of the world might look like but especially because it helps us communicate that theory to others and it helps us understand the implications of that theory more consistently than if it were just trapped in our heads. Specifically, let's take this theory of, of uh, personhood as depicted by this model and how clinics work and let's see the logical implications of that theory over time. So we're gonna go to this baseline, which is an experiment. Okay, these experiments depict scenarios um, where we will take this theory of the world and run it under particular assumptions. Assumptions involving risk behavior, assumptions involving the number of clinics that are available to treat people and the staffing levels at those clinics, involving people's predilection towards care seeking, given symptoms, etc. So we're, we're gonna go to baseline here and we're going to right click on baseline and choose run. This is several, of several ways in any logic we can run a scenario. And it's not a particularly privileged one. It is one that has the virtue of, of um, being very clear about exactly what scenario you're running. For those who didn't catch that, you're gonna go here under the model, right click on baseline and press run, and you're gonna come up with a screen like this which is gonna allow us to speed up the model, set what we wanna look at. We're just gonna say run here for now, okay? So here, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to see a model that depicts these individuals. And I'll tell you, we'll see very well before the day is out how this is done. These individuals are arranged in an income, uh, a fashion where their physical location is shaped by their income. Higher incomes are to the right and exhibit uh, more sparse networks, lower incomes are to the left and are associated with crowding. And each of these individuals here that you see, each of those figures is an individual, a particular person. So we have a theory of personhood and each particular person is in a specific state with respect to this uh, infection status in a specific state with respect to care seeking at any given time. But over time, ladies and gentlemen, these individuals will evolve. And I'm gonna use this, this button here to speed this model up. And I'm going to go back up here to this. For those who didn't catch it, I went down with this navigation menu to the population. I kind of, I can go browse different individuals who you'll notice are in different states. This person is under care right now, is in a recovered state, for example, um, perhaps having been recently delivered care, et cetera. We're, we're gonna go up and now you'll see that over time, the composition of this population is changing. Models like this help us understand the consequences of theory over time and they 
they model the evolution of the health state of the population as time progresses. So here we're going to see down in the lower left here, and I will make this uh, more full screen. Okay, it stopped now. I'll rerun it. I just press this red button. I'm going to press run again just so you can see it. We see time playing out over time. Uh, okay, we see time playing out. Um, and uh, I can play it multiple times if I want to. I can stop and run it. Now, as we do that, however, I'm going to right click on the screen and drag. Now, on a Mac, Winchell can state in a stentorian voice how we do right click. What is it? Com uh, option? Yeah, if you, if, if you have or is it two finger swipe? Right, that's not the yeah. It's two finger swipe will do it? Um, Okay. Okay. So mostly uh, two finger will do it, but if you, that doesn't work, option, and then you could just click on the trackpad and drag. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Okay, so if we do that, we can go up above and we can see some patterns. And ladies and gentlemen, you'll notice that we've shown, although this model depicts individuals enmeshed in networks and transmitting infection over networks to each other, um, we will note that we can summarize the status of that population over time at any different numbers of levels. Just like epidemiological data, um, we can we can slice and dice it in different ways, perform cross tabs on it. We can characterize the state of this population in different ways. The difference from empirical epidemiological data is that we have, we have as it were, a God's eye view of the situation. We know the complete situation in this, in this micro world to which we have recourse, unlike typically in the external world. And as a result, we, we can secure insights as to what what is going on within the model that are particularly um, powerful. And here we have summarized only some simple statistics in light of that power. We've only just tapped it. So over time we've depicted the prevalence of infection at a fractional level um, for low SES individuals in green and high SES individuals in gray here. Okay, And we could see there's fluctuations, but broadly speaking, the low SES uh, suffers a, a higher, uh, uh, higher prevalence of, of infection, a higher burden of infection than, than the uh, high SES. So the low SES is disproportionately burdened. Now up here, we see a different type of statistic. We see one that's longitudinal in character. Here, these are for individuals over the course of their lifetimes, for 5,000 days, um, it reflects the number of times they've gotten, um, they've gotten infected over the course of that. And here we see a, um, a histogram which depicts for high SES uh, individuals and low SES individuals. And one thing that you will note is that a large fraction of high SES individuals have never gotten infected at all. Um, and those who have gotten infected um, a smaller number has had large numbers of infections compared to low SES individuals. If we go over here more to the right, we will see a different sort of depiction yet. This one was based on individual longitudinal history, and this one shows uh, a, a, has that characteristic in common. We have infection count on the vertical axis but what's shown on the horizontal axis here is income, ladies and gentlemen. Income of individuals within this population. And you'll notice a gradient. There's a gradient um, as income increases, the number of times an individual has gotten infected will broadly tend to decrease. There's, a, there's an association between those two that is negative with, with uh, increasing income. That is, higher income means lower, uh, lower burden of infection. Until at some point, the bottom kind of drops out of that curve. Now, I'd like you to note the shape of that curve because we will note that this association, which is observed between income on the one hand 
and infection count on the other will evolve with different scenarios. This is not a given. This is a reflection, for example, of our, of our policy regime, okay? As will be these other, um, other outputs. So ladies and gentlemen, here we have a model. This model is dependent on sort of a, a theory of personhood that involves not just a person in isolation, but with respect to networks in which they're enmeshed. We can depict disparities here associated with, with income. Um, and by characterizing a model like this of, of, uh, with individuals and uh, disparities over time, we can um, that depict the evolution of burden of illness over time, we can understand the implications of our theory more completely than if that theory was simply in our head. We as humans are exquisitely uh, effective at certain types of problems. And one where we're not very effective is understanding in very precise terms the implication of a quantitative theory of the world for the dynamic implications of it over time. We're not very effective at, at, at performing those calculations in our head. That's something a computer can do. Computers are very good at stupid things that have to be done again and again and again. And this is, this is a case where they can be given some rules and told, tell me the consequences of these rules for behavior over time. And that's what we're looking at here, okay? Um, we're looking at the behavior over time of this system given this theory of personhood and given this theory of clinichood. Okay, now ladies and gentlemen, we looked at the baseline. I'd like you to now go to the baseline with one clinic. This is an alternative scenario. We often use these models in large part to ask what if questions about different scenarios. Now importantly, ladies and gentlemen, these models work hand in glove with traditional statistical tools tools. The toolboxes of traditional epidemiology and public health and biostatistics are highly complementary with these sorts of models. They're not replacements for those, far from it. They help, they help those toolboxes go further in terms of linking them up to policy impact, linking them up to their ability to explain patterns that would otherwise be cryptic. But ladies and gentlemen, um, one of the virtues, one of the draws of these sort of dynamic models is their capacity to look at questions about counterfactual interventions. Interventions that have never been observed and for which statistical data is therefore not directly available. An intervention that may be novel um, in, in a particular city, novel in the country, novel in terms of its um, introduction anywhere in the world, we still have the capacity to examine the, to probe the impact of those, uh, of those interventions using a model like this because it depicts the underlying posited mechanisms, the underlying theory. We can ask, well, what's the implication of, for that theory if we have this type of policy regime? So we're going to go to this baseline with one clinic, right click on that, and click run here, okay? Um, and now, ladies and gentlemen, in this clinic, if we go click down here, we'll see there's a clinic here. This clinic is treating individuals over time. Some of those individuals are, are making it through to behavioral counts. Um, excuse me, there's no behavioral counseling going on in this pathway, this intervention yet but they are making it through to, um, to be treated. We have a very high capacity demand, um, so the clinic is very busy. Uh, a lot of individuals here are balking because the clinic is, involves too long a wait, for example, but this clinic is treating individuals, okay? Now, we could ask, how does that availability of that clinic affect the burden of illness in the population? And we can take a look, for example, at the prevalence here um, over time for individuals uh, in the low SES state as well as the high SES state. Here is the um, depiction of that uh, association that we saw earlier, ladies and gentlemen. And one of the things that we'll see is that there is a somewhat shifting down uh, of this uh, average um, illness burden. But nonetheless, it retains its, its overall gradient here, going to the right. 
So it has somewhat affected this curve, um, but not materially. One thing that may be useful is to look at cumulative SES um, in infections and low SES and high SES, but I'm not going to be spending a lot of time with this. So having done this, ladies and gentlemen, we can start to look at, at interventions uh, of other sorts. We can innovate. We can ask, what if we have this clinic and we have behavioral counseling in place that would help people lower their their risk, um, for example, how would that lower um, the burden of illness in the population? And we can see the implications of this play out. So broadly speaking, within models like this, we can ask what if questions um, in a very uh, ready fashion, given a certain theory of the world, we can say, okay, if we have that theory, what would the implications be over time if we were to introduce this innovation, if we were to introduce this policy regime, what would we expect in terms of the implications, for example, for this gradient between income and infection count? And once again, we've seen that this intervention has affected this gradient. I'll show you one more intervention here. Um, and this intervention uh, is going to be actually something, ladies and gentlemen, that you folks will introduce, okay? So you're going to modify for your first time a model, okay? So I'd like you to go to baseline here, and I would like you to right click on baseline and choose copy, okay? Choose copy, okay? And now I would like you to right click, and again, if, if you're on a Mac, Instead of right-clicking, you do, um, Winchell, uh, uh, option click? Yeah, option left click. Option left click, thank you. Um, and then you will right-click on the model as a whole and say paste, okay? And now it will say baseline one. So TAs, could you be prepared for deployment here? Okay, who needs TA help? What I did is I went down to baseline, I right clicked on it, I said copy, and then I went up to the model as a whole and I said paste, okay? And now I'm going to say baseline here. Now in the baseline, what I am going to do is I am going to set the, uh, set, uh, change the, the risk parameters so that we can see a, um, uh, a somewhat, uh, different behavior. So specifically for the contact rate here in this baseline one, let's rename baseline one, excuse me. So if you click on baseline one, you should be able to go to this properties window on the right hand side. If you don't see it, you can go to view properties. If you don't see it visible, or you can ask Winchell to help you here. Winchell stands ready. Okay. So if you click on this, go to properties, and I'd like you to change baseline to be, um, uh, you could type out lower contact rate, okay? And I'll say 5%, okay? 5% lower contact rate, okay? Lower contact rate, I'll say by 5%, okay? lower contact rate by 5%. So what I've done is I've renamed this new scenario that I've created. So I've, I want to define a new lens for asking a what if question with this model, a new, a new what if question. I did that by copying the baseline, by pasting it in, and I named it lower contact rate by 5%, and then Critically, ladies and gentlemen, having done that, I'm going to go to contact rate and I'm going to change it to 0 0.95 per day. Okay? Okay. Um, so it's, instead of 1, it's now 0 0.95. And you will notice, ladies and gentlemen, that that then changes the boldness here of this. Uh, uh, of the parameter. That's an indication it's a departure from the baseline value, ladies and gentlemen, or from the default value in the model. So 0.95 
we change it from one, hence it makes this bold. So it's a departure from the default value within the model, okay? You'll notice distance threshold is also a departure from that um, that was inherited from baseline. So 0.95, ladies and gentlemen, instead of one. Anyone need help with that? Um, yes. I don't need help, um, Nate. I'm just saying, I don't, I don't notice the contact rate being bolded when I change the contact yeah. rate. No, I neither. Um, but it could be because we're on the PLE and I'm on the advanced version, so I'm not sure maybe that's... Very interesting. So, so... Um, Okay, um, so you actually don't see it bold. It's just plain type. Yeah. Yeah, the only thing is the rest. The only thing is the rest. Wow. Um, okay. Come and take a look. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really interested. Uh, well, I'll be. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, you're right. Wow, look at that. Um, and uh, if, I, I just want to make sure if I leave it, it doesn't. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Well, well uh, okay. Um, learn something new every day. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to right click now on this new one we've created and let's run that. Okay. So, we set the contact rate to be 0.95 and I just ran it. How did I run it? I again right clicked on it and said run. Ladies and gentlemen, and now I'm going to say run here, and you'll notice that we are running it. And I don't know if you remember, but we have, we actually had a previous prevalence level of about 0.4 for the low SES, and now it's been brought down materially to somewhere just below 0.3 on average. There's still st significant stochastic vari variability. But we've also somewhat, somewhat reduced, well actually very significantly reduced this um, curve here. So ladies and gentlemen, there used to be a gradient here of income versus infe uh, infection count um, that is still retained broadly, but the infection count levels we're seeing here are less than half of what we saw before on the left hand side. Now, this is of great significance because this exhibits what we call nonlinearity. Um, it may seem it may seem just an odd fact, but but fundamentally, ladies and gentlemen, we lowered the contact rate by by five percent from one to 0.95, and it approximately halved, divided by more than two. The, the actual uh, infection counts that were observed over the course of the study. So a 5% change can yield a disproportionate impact. Um, and this points to the fact that when we're running models like this, it's not always additive. Um, we, just by, because we, we change something by 5%, we could have a dramatic qualitative night and day difference sometimes. We could reach a tipping point where we go from a situation where it's very adverse and just a little bit more investment, we could get to a situation where it's a game changer and things change dramatically. Social norms change, um, the, the, the uh, prevalence of infection changes, the, um, the uh, overloading at clinics change, etc. So ladies and gentlemen, um, here we have a uh, a marked change in the burden of infection. Let me show you one more, if, if, if we would. And for this one, I'd like to also get you to change something um, that's a little bit more of a challenge. So this one, it's the 75% contact rate among low SES, do you see that? It's the second to last one here on the left, okay. And I'd like you to run, to, to, sorry, right click on that and choose copy and then go up and I would like to go to the model as a whole and click paste, ladies and gentlemen. Now there'll be a, a second one and it's actually renamed it. And I'd like to call this, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to call it 95% contact rate among low SES rather than 75, okay? 95%. So we've just, copied one scenario, and we've, we're going to modify it to, to accord it with the name. We've just renamed it. So what did I do? I right-clicked on 75%. I pasted it in. I right-clicked right on that, 
75% copy, chose copy. I clicked on the model as a whole and did paste, and I renamed it to 95%. Are we okay with that? Now let's make sure it's 95%. So in order to do that, ladies and gentlemen, in the properties area, I'm going to go to this place where it says perform intervention uh, for person here. And I'd like you to scroll over and make sure that's 0 0.95 there. Um, I'm not sure on yours, it may be something different. Do you see, uh, so 0 0.9. 0 0.9, make it 0 0.95, okay? Make it 0.95, okay? Now, what this is, what we have here, and we'll see in the course of this boot camp how you can articulate this in your models. What we have here is a, not just a blanket rule for an intervention, apply this, you know, a lowered contact rate for everyone. Instead, what we have is a conditional rule, a contingent rule. For those whose income is less than $400, we are going to undertake this intervention. We are going to lower their contact rate while in a severe symptomatic state to by 5%. In other words, we're going to multiply it by 0.95. Okay. Excuse me. Yes. Where did you change the contact rate? Uh, I, I, uh, Ron, I went to, I went to this new one we created. I got that. I went to perform intervention to person, oh, thank you, and I changed it to be, a ton so at the end, what this is saying is make the existing contact rate make it, make it whatever it is times 0.95. Okay. okay. 0.95. Yeah. Okay. Can we run that thing? Let's, let's run it. How do you think, ladies and gentlemen, that might affect that association, that observed association we saw on the baseline between income on the one hand and infection count on the other? How do you think changing the contact rate just for those in the low income category would affect things, would affect that, that uh, income gradient? Anyone wanna hazard a guess? Well, after all, a computer can help us can help us uh, understand this better. So, ladies and gentlemen, I just ran it, and I am going to go up to here and go over here to this area. I'm I'm letting this thing play out here. Okay, we're running this. We're only intervening in the low income group, and this is what I'll see. What do I see? What? Can anyone help me make, make sense of, of what I'm seeing here? You're seeing something different than I am. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. No, uh, we're, not, we're not getting My scale order, is wrong on my graph. But maybe we need something. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're not, it's, we, yeah, even if you maximize it, we're, it, it doesn't want to shift down. Okay, so could, need, could the TAs look the at this? The is a one on the top. So instead of 800, I have one. It's a root. Okay. Um, it's really Okay. Okay. Yeah, so if, ladies and gentlemen, the way I'm getting up here is by right clicking and dragging. Okay. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I was um, modifying this uh, just before the session as possible. I mean, this particular scenario is possible. I, I changed something initially. I didn't think so. But what we're seeing here is an income gradient where we have some, some real differences imposed by the intervention of, of lower burdens of infection for the lower groups. It actually rises and, and then uh, is lower below uh, and then progressively goes down above a certain level. So I, I don't want to get caught up in the particulars of this. We could track down what's going on. Um, but I, I will note this, ladies and gentlemen, that interventions very significantly shape counterfactual interventions or interventions at all, counterfactual or observed. They materially shape the associations observed between quantities in the population. And one of the challenges that we have when dealing with statistical data alone as, as our only tool is that, um, uh, that 
if we have a situation which is counterfactual, we haven't observed it ever, or if we have a situation where the policy regime has changed things, some of the associations that have been observed historically might not be observed going forward, for example, for projection purposes. And a dynamic model, by contrast, by characterizing the mechanics of the situation, an underlying theory of how clinics work, an underlying theory of, of um, people and, and how they behave, et cetera, um, in order, by capturing these things, ladies and gentlemen, um, we can actually, this theory of personhood, I'll just show it here rather than trying to find it dynamically, this theory of personhood, by capturing that underlying theory, we can then ask questions um, about impacts um, that, that will help us be less affected by these changed associations that we see in, counter, in, in counterfactual policy regimes in um, in the case of of uh, in the case of interventions as they might affect uh, associations, these models are not association based. They posit some underlying causal structure to the system, and because that causal structure is maintained, even in counterfactual policy regimes, we we can capture counterfactual situations with greater robustness than if we are wholly dependent on associational data. Associational data changes when the data generating process changes, as statisticians would put it. As we change the data generating process, the process that gives rise to associations, those associations may be altered. So when we think about dynamic models, models which posit some causal structure and help us understand the implications of that causal structure over time, they are different from, say, a classic projection model because they're not based so much upon the associations as a theory uh, of causal structure, which can then be challenged and can then be refined by understanding its implications over time and comparing it to empirical data. So models like this, ladies and gentlemen, they help us depict causal structure. They help us understand the implications of that theory for behavior over time. And by so doing, they help us more quickly learn from empirical evidence, which is absolutely essential. They help us actually learn better from, from the findings of our statistical methods because they help us check the degree to which a given theory of the world is consistent with observed evidence in ways we wouldn't be able to do if it were just in our head. If, if our theory of personhood were in our head, however articulated it was, um, it, it wouldn't be so easy for us to say, well, okay, is that theory consistent with this empirical evidence? Because we're not very good about reasoning like that in our heads. With a simulation model, we can more quickly we can more quickly check, is a theory of personhood consistent with the empirical evidence? If it's not, improve our theory. And if it is consistent, deepen our theory. Um, in short, we can learn more quickly, more robustly, and, and more reliably by depicting our theories with models, running them out to understand the implications. Now, models like this, I would note, are thoroughly um, uh, thoroughly need a, um, a uh, work close working relationship with statistical methods. It's not an either or. It's not that these are alternatives to statistical methods. Far from it. They often build the top statistical methods. And let's just take a look for a moment about um, where some of those methods might come in. For example, let's take a look at this transition. I went to person here, double clicked on person. I'm going to go look at this transition from recovered back to susceptible. You'll notice that this is associated with a, what's called a rate transition. How did I get there? Again, I went to person. I clicked on this link back, and I went to look in properties, and I see there's a rate. What is this rate? Well, ladies and gentlemen, for those who are statistics background, you probably would call this a hazard rate. Um, okay, This is a... It's not a probability, it's probably a density. It's a chance per day of, of, of uh, going from recovered to susceptible. 
Um, and in this case, it's, it's a rate such that an average, on average, a person will spend 45 days in the recovered state. So to deduce that rate, you might use survival analysis, right? You might conduct survival analysis to identify the hazard rate of going back from a, a recovered state to a susceptible state. Um, alternatively, if we wanted to understand, uh, for example, the, the likelihood a person who's ill seeks care, we might use statistical methods to, to, to look at some empirical data to try to derive that, that, um, that probability. If we wanted to understand how many contacts a person has over time whilst in the infective severe state, we might look at historic data involving contact patterns, such as we collect with our smartphone-based system, and analyze that with statistical methods to arrive at a robust estimate of, um, of the uh, contact rate while in the state and vary it on a per-person basis within our model. In short, models like this are not, they're not devoid of, of um, dependence on statistics. Far from it, many models like this have have very um, large amounts of ways in which they've incorporated statistical methods, but they complement those methods and they take them further in terms of linking them up with policy questions, okay? So, ladies and gentlemen, dynamic models encode theories of the world, help us understand the logical implications of those theory, help us learn more quickly from empirical evidence by helping us understand if our theories of the world are consistent with that evidence and help us ask questions about counterfactual interventions. Okay, glimpse of model, okay? Um, so I'd like to close that model out here. That was our, that was uh, a, a glimpse of a, um, of a model from, um, uh, from communicable illness involving as well discrete event modeling. If we go double click on this introductory GDM model, and I'll get rid of this one here, we don't need this. Uh, introductory GDM model, we double click on person, we will see another model. Um, this model depicts individuals over t um, as they evolve over time, uh, going from a pregnant state, uh, a non-pregnant to a pregnant state, um, and within the pregnant state, um, being subject to a normal glycemic pregnancy or a dysglycemic pregnancy. Individuals here can be either in a obese state, an overweight state, or a normal weight state. And then over here, they have a certain status with respect to diabetes. Normal glycemic, pre-diabetic, and, and having full frank type two diabetes. You will notice that there are mortality rates incorporated as well uh, by age. So those mortality rates will vary as a person ages. And up here on the upper part of person, you will find a physical activity level depicted where people's physical activity is tracked over time as a continuous quantity. This is called a system dynamics component. This is a stock and flow. And for those who are from mathematical epidemiology background, this is associated with a differential equation that is solved here, okay? But a person's physical activity is being determined at an individual level here. And one of the factors that affects their physical activity, if we click on target physical activity level, is posited to be the physical activity level of the people around them. So I clicked here, target physical activity level, I'm going to properties, and I'm looking at the target, and you'll notice the target one is based on the weighted average of the physical activity level of their connections. And as you might guess, they're gonna be placed in social networks, and those individuals who are linked to them in those social networks are here posited to affect their, their perception of what an appropriate target physical activity level is, and that will end up impacting their physical activity. So we're gonna spend less time on this, but I would like to run this model, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to do so by going to baseline and clicking run. And if we do so, 
we will see a uh, visual depiction. So here we have individuals depicted uh, with visual status that varies um, in rather graphical form um, as to their age, their weight status, their, their diabetes status. Um, and you'll notice that some individuals here are, um, are uh, exhibit um, uh, elevated girth, while, while other individuals uh, have, have a more svelte profile. Um, uh, we will also note that there are some individuals who are yet small, this one uh, being a, an infant in diapers, um, and uh, this one being a, a somewhat older child. There are two types of networks depicted, familial networks, which are shown in red, and uh, broader social networks, which are shown in black here. So you have these family clusters, uh, and individuals, uh, in this case, uh, are particularly strongly affected by their family members, okay? Um, I believe the red is actually a specific indication of linkages uh, of a child to its mother, an offspring to its mother. The offspring no longer be, may no longer be a child. And ladies and gentlemen, the colors here, I believe that the, um, uh, the purple color here depicts uh, pregnant individuals. Um, and, uh, and then individuals are further colored uh, uh, in, in yellow or red according to their uh, glycemic status. So if we go down here, we can actually go see, for example, prediabetes. You'll notice a prediabetic individual is colored in a tomato color, and and this um, type two diabetes, they're colored in this. So that they're, they're, this is this purple. This, these are type two diabetic individuals. Okay, now um, this model is a chronic disease model, and it broadly reflects some of our work over the course of the past decade in gestational diabetes. We have a paper in American Journal of Public Health uh, on modeling in gestational diabetic area, as well as many papers uh, together with my colleague Roland Dick, um, uh, which, are, which are focused on, um, looks at the uh, uh, administrative data and patterns of diabetes uh, over time. Um, Alan is also working with us as his dissertation topic in exactly this area, gestational and type 2 diabetes, using an extraordinary multi-generational data set involving gestational and type 2 diabetes we have from SASC Health, as well as dynamic modeling. So this model um, depicts some of these linkages, including risk factors associated with intergenerational transfer of risk. So the fact that an individual is exposed in utero um, is, is maintained as a person's characteristic beyond others such as their SES index, their birth weight in grams, their mother, their mother's age at delivery, uh, and her pre-pregnancy weight category, uh, et cetera. So this model is a model that can be used to help secure insights when compared against, say, rich administrative data sets involving uh, gestational type 2 diabetes and could be used to try to tease out the impacts of interventions. And you'll notice, ladies and gentlemen, there's a whole set of interventions here which have to do with uh, changing physical activity, changing, um, uh, changing uh, people's um, physical activity in a way that's particularly focused at, at reproductive age women and pregnant women, for example, and aspects of, of better control of, of uh, gestational diabetes, such as through, through uh, in administration of insulin. Okay, so this is a model from chronic disease that we may explore more later in the week, okay? So glimpse of two models, a buzzing, blooming confusion. I'm sure you have lots of questions lots of things that need to be pinned down. I'd like now to talk to try to make sense of these models if I could for a brief time. Is that okay? Do people need a break for, for, um, for washroom? Would that be, would that be good? Yeah? Okay. Okay, why don't we break for, uh, for five minutes then? And uh, we'll start up a, um, a lecture then on, on 
the role of system science, and then big data and its combination with system science, which I think is a tremendously um, a tremendous uh, area of growth for coming years. Okay. So uh, come back in five minutes, and we'll we'll continue on to these lectures.